And today, the, as we continue the Advent series, this message is entitled, The Building of God's Temple. So Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In Zechariah 6, 12 through 15. And say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch... For he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord, as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jedidiah, Hen and the son and Hen the son of Zephaniah and those who are far off shall come and build the temple of the Lord and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God you may be seated from the binding of Satan, the king, takes his throne. In the process of that, there was one aspect of the first coming of Jesus that is inaugurated fully in the plan of redemption that we highlight today. And this, as you know, is the building of God's temple. In talking about this, we again are struck with the question of how this relates to the discussion of the end time. Oh, we won't go into the depths of those details, but this is surrounding that whole issue. And in that, there is even the question of whether there will be a physical temple rebuilt before the second coming of Jesus, which will be, according to some, the millennial temple in the literal thousand-year earthly reign of Jesus Christ. Is that going to happen? If that was true, then the branch from last week that we heard about and the branch we hear about in this passage from Zechariah is strictly future. We, should do, we sure do need to test that interpretation. As we look at this, what's important to see is the progression of history in the plan of God, and in that, the question ought to be answered whether there will be a physical temple rebuilt in the future. Will that happen? Or was everything in progression to a different temple that is not made with hands? We will dig into that progression if you follow along on your bulletin first, and then Uh, We'll look at the building of God's temple in more detail and its significance. And then there are some important applications for us today that I hope we hear. So right away, as Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden by God, what takes place? Genesis 3, 24 says, "He He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What was in the inner sanctuary of Solomon's temple on either side of the Ark of the Covenant? There were two cherubim. So right away in Genesis 3, there was already temple imagery that looks ahead to Solomon's temple further and further. But before Solomon's temple, there was the the tabernacle, right? The mobile temple. 
In the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which on, its, uh, uh, on it, facing each other, were what? Two cherubim. And before this most holy place in the tabernacle and in the temple was the veil separating that space from the rest. So as humanity was driven out of the garden, God had planned to make a dwelling place for himself to be with his people. But as we should know, this was temporary, right? And it was a type of representation of something much greater. We see this something greater in the glimpse we get of Jesus in Isaiah 6. Notice the similarities and the true reality of the dwelling place of God at that time. Though there was a physical temple in various stages of human history. Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the, the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the whole house was filled with smoke. Those slight differences possibly, notice the seraphim surrounding Jesus where the very presence of God dwells. Notice the veil of vision that Isaiah was brought into. Notice that Jesus is in the temple and the train of his robe fills the temple. Psalm 68, 18, which is cited in Ephesians 4, 8. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train, receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Notice also that the foundations of the thresholds were shaking. Now when we get to the death of Jesus, there are two figures, one on each side of him. The temple, or the curtain in the temple, what happened to it? Tore in two. And what was the earth doing? Shook. And as that took place, what was happening? What was happening? There would no longer ever be a temple made with hands. There would no longer be a veil separating us from God as well. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And so since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near With a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is driving ultimately to where our sanctuary is, which is in union with Christ himself and where he is. What does Ephesians 2 say? We are seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And remember Jeremiah 17, 12, part of our call to worship. This is the progression from the person of Jesus. And is that he then goes on as he, in his ministry, he says, he is the true temple. In John 2, 18 through 21, says this, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for, these, for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So as we become united to him, united to Jesus in our salvation, what do we then become? 
As we are in him and become united to him as one, then we are the temple of God as individuals. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 2 Corinthians 6, 10, or 6, 16 says, For we are the temple of the living God. As this is true of us individually, if we are truly in Christ, then this brings us to ultimately where we land today. Collectively, the church is God's temple, which he builds. This is where all this progression that we noted very briefly, all this progression drives to as the fruit of Jesus' finished work is the church. The very focus. He came for the church. He gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, the church, present her to himself. Now, before we get into further significance of this temple, the collective church, who is the body, the bride, the army, the family of God, just stop for a minute and think about this. Do you think about the progression of history that we just noted very briefly? The significance of the church, not from our perspective for a minute, From God's perspective. How he sees this. Now this must be foundational to how we view all of what we'll talk about today. And as Olive tells me often, keep this in your head. Keep that in your head for later. The significance of how God sees his church as this will develop clearly into what the church has become, even though it has always existed, just think about God's design and God's work and bringing this to fruition. God's design and God's work for the church. Out, of the, out from the tree of life would flow living water where sinners could come at no cost and drink everlasting life. And they would come from all nations, all nations, and gather into God's sanctuary, which is in his Son, to be the body of Christ that would worship him now and forevermore. And Jesus came to die for this bride, sanctify this bride, and present this bride to himself. This is the significance of the church from God's perspective. May we truly see that. But what is the church more specifically? The church is the ecclesia, which is literally meaning an assembly. In the general meaning of the term, it means citizens called out of their homes into some public place to gather. So the very definition at the root is the literal physical gathering or assembly of people that are taken out of separateness and gathered together as a group, as a collective body of people. The church of God is the assembly of the citizens of his kingdom that are called out of the world by God's grace while they live in the world and are gathered together to do at the very foundation to worship their triune God. 
These citizens of the kingdom gather as an assembly in a public place. How God has structured them as the pillar and buttress of truth. According to his structure, him is the head. And they structure their government according to his word. And they live out their life together according to his word, reforming to his word. Whether it's in a home, school, warehouse, more historically like this, a historically looking church, in a secret place, in a field. But they themselves, they themselves are the church. Wherever they are gathered physically together. More definitional aspects of the church can be seen in places like 1 Corinthians 1, 2, which says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can see the truth of the universal church, the church of God, one Body, through all history, through all time, the universal church as one, and the truth that individual local assemblies of churches gather separately. We see that both in that text, and both are fundamental. It is as a whole church of God, which is that physical assembly, assembly that is possessed by God and comes from God, the church of God. And throughout the generations of history, there are numerous churches that exist in physical places on earth as separate local churches. As there was a church in Corinth, there was a church in Philippi. As there was a church in Friedensburg, so there is a church in Morgantown and Valley View. With a surface look at this text, 1 Corinthians 1 2, it is heavily implied, which is supported by other clear texts, and even as we get deeper in there, which we will in a second, that this gathering is a consistent gathering of people, a consistent gathering. So fluctuating here and there because of relocating and occasional circumstances, each local body was a group of people who met regularly, that came together faithfully. But under the surface, if we look at the present ongoing text of those who call upon, it is actually plural, those, plural, those calling upon, ongoing, present tense, calling, active upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This calling upon, the name of Jesus comes from and is founded upon true salvation in Jesus. It's fundamental. If you're not a child of God, you're not a part of the body of Christ. That is essential. And it's because of the belief in the gospel that God has caused and produced within you that you are a child of God. You look to Christ and Christ alone for the salvation of your soul. Romans 10, 13 through 17 shows us that this is essential to those who gather together. How are they to call on him in whom they have not heard? How are they to hear unless someone goes and preaches? And on and on. That explanation. So from belief in the true gospel of the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ alone, they, the church, call upon his name in their assembly as they gather together. So this is not the moralistic person who says obedience to the law is how you are a Christian, yet they break at least one commandment, the fourth and not coming to church and not keeping the Sabbath holy, when they don't gather with the church for a long period of time. That's not them. In multiple aspects, that's not them. This is not the person who says that they can worship God in creation, so therefore they don't need to gather with the body of believers. 
This is not the person who has made it a perpetual part of their life to, quote unquote, go to church online week in and week out. It's not existing. If you got snowed in, like I'm in here. We're not talking about perfection and all of that. With this present tense ongoing calling upon Jesus from the gathering of the church, we must heed the warning that Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 gives us in saying this. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting, not forsaking, that's present active, not forsaking to meet together, as is the habit of some. It's a habitual thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's a consistent thing. But encouraging, again, present, active, ongoing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In this we see that the church is the gathering of those who are calling upon the name of Jesus, which is the outward expression of an inward salvation that they have been given by God. So they call upon him in their gathering. They're dependent upon him. They appeal to him. They worship him. How is that inward reality known? It is known by the fruit of salvation, which again, is seen in belief in the gospel message about how a sinner is saved in Christ. It is then showing evidence of the grace and knowledge of Jesus according to the scriptures. It's showing evidence of that salvation, that living faith that shows itself. Furthermore, as we connect this back to the building of God's temple that began in the first coming of Jesus, our text from Ephesians 2 must bring all the significance of the church back to be very clear to us, especially as this is specifically talking about us Gentiles. We, those Gentiles, who are truly in Christ, if you are, we are no longer strangers, no longer aliens, no longer alienated from the covenant promise of promise, but we are fellow citizens with the saints. We are members household of God. We are grafted into the olive tree with the covenant people of God, the remnant of Israel. And this household of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And this household is the growing temple of God, which God builds. This is the dwelling place for God to be with his collective body by the Spirit. So we are not only individually temples of God, but we gather as the church, the physical assembly. And when we do, we are together the temple of God. And this temple is being built and has been ever since the fall. But more fully, because of the plan of redemption in Jesus, Ever since his finished work, that has been an explosion of reality, an expansion of that gospel truth that includes us. This is the temple spoken of in Zechariah. It is not a physical millennial temple made by hands that will be in our future. It's not what it's saying. What joy should this bring us? All the significance of the progression of history, the design of God, the work of God, bringing to fruition His church, building His church. What joy should this bring us when we put all of this together? All of what we just went through. We should just stop for a couple of hours and just ponder that. Just be silent and reflect and meditate on that truth of all the scriptures of what they say. What a massive importance this should be in our lives. Massive importance. What a priority. A sacrifice. 
this should be for us. A desire, a big, a deep desire, hunger, and also a duty. We're commanded to gather. This is why I can't believe it. When a pastor calls for for the need of consistent, faithful attendance and for regenerate membership, being founded on the premise that you're born again and that's a work of God that he shows. I can't believe it when that's called for and people get mad. People leave churches. Because they somehow don't agree with that. While professing Christ. Or they take it personally. Like that pastor is singling them out or something. Does that boggle your mind? How that happens? And again, consider what we just talked about. And we could spend years on that. Unpacking all of that. And this is where we've gotten today. Where the church is treated even less than a country club membership. Less than. Not even equal to, but less than. Less than a zeal to sit for three hours watching sports. And less than a dedication for other social events and recreation or hobbies. It is incredibly sad that this is even an issue in most churches in America. But it is, and it's a major one. The Southern Baptist Convention, do you know how many members about they have on their uh, actual role of membership? About three million you know about how many actually faithfully go, attend church? Half, about half that. They've dealt with this. And they're the biggest denomination in America. It says something. What's so necessary that we can't be at church? Now again, not talking perfection like you have to be here every single Sunday. That never should be in your mind. Right, come on. But what's so necessary that we can't be here? And if you get mad at that, I'm sorry. Sickness is one thing. Physical hindrances or living in a nursing home can be an issue depending on the circumstances. Yes. Jobs, okay, there's jobs of necessity, like being a first responder or having certain medical professions. Or there may be even occasional circumstances. Yes. But what's so necessary? We can't be here. From the progression of God's temple through redemptive history demonstrated earlier, that again was quite brief. If you think about it, on to the actual life, death, resurrection, and ascension, and the giving of the Holy Spirit in and through the person and work of Jesus, the person and purpose of him. If we continue with our typical, current, American idea of the Lord's Day, of church itself, and the biblical model of what membership ought to be, what are we saying to our triune God? What are we saying to him? Take all the people in the equation out. And what are you saying to him when that's the situation? What does this negligence or indifference or apathy that we've got in this country especially, what does that say to our head? Our head, Jesus Christ. Who is the king on the throne that we heard about last week? 
that we hear about today in Zechariah 6? What does that say to him? Yet we want to skirt by with a minimal, a minimum of, of maybe attending once a month or maybe just on communion days or maybe once every month and a half. And yet we want to feel like we can send money to a church and never go. And by that, God loves me. Yet we want to say, oh, I got confirmed, so I'm good. While that person is never gathered with the physical assembly of God's people. Honestly. Yet we want to keep higher priorities than this on this one day. He set out one day, not six, one. And we can't give him that. Yet we want to float around to two or more churches, never giving real commitment to one. But like the tactics of our society, we want to keep our options open in case something comes up that's better. Now, this does not include needing to find a church and putting real time and effort into finding a biblical one. Again, that should be obvious. That's not what we're talking about. There should be an intention to, to find a church and settle in, to grow, to put in roots, to be involved, because we know what the body of Christ is. But it's not church hopping all over the place. Oh, I didn't like it there, so I'm going to go there. I didn't like it there, so I'm going to go there. And back and forth and back and forth and all over the place. Because we want it our own way. We don't want to just land because we are entitled to have it our, way, our own way today, right? You could give millions to the church. Work for long hours in physical labor for the church. Watch hours of sermons on YouTube. But if you are not physically gathered with the assembly in an ongoing manner then you should not be a member of the church visibly. And at that point, if that's a consistent thing, I would question your salvation and being an invisible member of the body of Christ. If there are issues like this in an ongoing, perpetual pattern manner, does it make sense? Now, why would I question that? Why, would any, why should anybody question that? Because there's something really off. There's something really off. There's a huge disconnect there that really shouldn't be there. All the giving, all the labor, all the added study, all the activity should be founded upon our presence within the consistent physical gathering as the body of Christ because we understand what that is. We have a hunger for it, a desire for it. There are so many problems with this particular issue today. It is hard to know where to begin, but today, in this church, we seek to approve an amendment to our bylaws regarding membership because of the inclusion of a category, mainly, of an inactive member that has been there, and I'm going to be honest with you, for far too long. And I say that because I love you. I'm called to shepherd you. There is no such thing in the Bible of an inactive member. There isn't. If you think there is, then show me. But there isn't. And if there's no such thing in the Bible, then honestly, why in the world would we even entertain that idea let alone keep that in place if we come to see that that needs to be changed. Think about this. From another angle, how can the church be built when the stones aren't there? When there's nothing to build with? Imagine if these building stones had arms and legs for a minute. What if they were there one day to be built with, 
So they were put into the wall. Then the following week, they decide to jump away and run and do something else. What about the stones that were maybe there one day or some days, but then left and didn't show back up, but still boasted about their position as a stone in that building? How could you build with stones like that? First Peter 2 says that we are living stones being built up as a spiritual house. And I thought about that illustration and it was funny. I came upon something that Charles Spurgeon said. So listen to this. He says, quote, I know there are some who say, well, I've given myself to the Lord, but I don't intend to give myself to any church. I say, now, why not? And they say, they answer, because I can be just as good a Christian without it. I say, are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your Lord's commands as by being obedient? There's a brick. What is the brick made for? It's made to build a house. It is of no use for the brick to tell you that it's just as good a brick while it's kicking about on the ground by itself as it would be as part of a house. Actually, it's a good-for-nothing brick. So you Rolling Stone Christians, I don't believe that you are answering the purpose for Christ for which Christ saved you. You're living contrary to the life with which Christ would have you live. And you are much to blame for the injury you do. End quote. Wow. One, he highlights the significance. Two, he highlights the implications of a brick not being a part of the body. Further, being built means a continued expansion. The people of God, the church, has been in the process of being built ever since the fall. And it will continue to be built within the new covenant era as we Gentiles are grafted in. This building will continue until the second advent of Christ. The people of God, as the temple of God, will gather in the name of Christ, believing in the one way of salvation in him alone. And when they gather, they gather by his sovereign hand. It is his doing, his work, what he produces that causes them to gather. Because by nature, we don't want to gather. It is a new, real desire of the regenerated sinner to gather physically, to be there, to be a part of it. And as we are conformed to God's word, we will see the characteristics of what membership is to be. That's why it is so completely backwards to hear a fight on it. Some would say that these amendments that we want to do are too strict. We should instead be more inclusive, they say, by accepting everyone into membership with no question. This is exactly a major pro part of the problem. This shows a fundamental lack of understanding and the most basic differences between true and false religion and what church means, what the church is. Basic. How can we not see and strive diligently after the building of God's temple, the church? We can't see it because many are shrouded in unbelief, blinded by sin, where they can't see the significance of God's truth. But as Zechariah says, we Gentiles, those who are far off, shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. 
We will be builders who labor to build something that is not made with hands. This means that for one, we will first be living as the building itself as it is being built. We are those living stones. Recreated in Christ Jesus for good works. Working them out. Both in an individual context and collective. That is a reality. And a major piece of this that drives to sanctification is our presence within the assembly together calling upon the name of the Lord by true faith. So God sanctifies you as an individual. Do you know he sanctifies you as a collective body as well? He sanctifies the church too. It's beautiful. Then flowing from that is the other inseparable reality of being building helpers which is evangelizing the nations, discipling the nations, calling them to obey the, co- the commandments of Christ, which is the plundering of Satan's house that we ought to find great energy in, knowing that Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will not, hell will not prevail against it. And having a joy, a joy, not just a superficial emotion, on the surface, though that is often there, a joy that is deep-seated in that heart, that new heart. Having a joy living together, living together, spending life together. And what's one of the most beautiful components of that? We have a unity in Christ that surpasses any blood unity, earthly blood unity, because we have a unity in the blood of Christ that binds us together. We live as the church for what it is while all of that is happening, while all of the building is happening. We stay faithful to that building. He will add to the number of his body and build. Does that mean that that number will rarely come together as the assembly despite the infinite significance of his church from God's perspective? Be an easy answer. I hope it is to you. Does that mean that they will put in the bare minimum despite what the work of regeneration and sanctification is biblically? Does that mean that that number will fight against what is clearly a biblical representation of the body and visible membership? These are questions we have to ask. And I hope you have answers to those. The answers that come from God. God's word. Because these are very basic in many ways. They've ravaged the church. We need to recover them, faithfully stand upon them, embrace them for what they truly are and the significance of this whole picture and have a joy that is overwhelming because of the grace of God. In Christ. May God build this church to be faithful to Christ. And I believe He is. May He continue. Let's pray.